I drink a lot of water. I'll probably drink at least three of these today. Three? Um, no. Pro probably maybe two. But I, I drink a lot of water. All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Good morning, everyone. How's everybody doing? Hopefully not too gloomy uh, from the weather. Uh, but we are glad that you are here. Uh, we, uh, we've been studying in our Sunday school hour um, titled the the Bible from the ground up <laughs> and we are I tell you kids these days huh um, we're we're understanding uh, how to read scripture how to study scripture uh, and doing that by kind of kind of breaking the Bible down into different sections we've talked um, recently, uh, most about genres, um, and so but just before we, we jump into anything too specific here, let me, let me go ahead and pray to start our time off together, and then we'll, we'll jump into some stuff. So let's pray. God, thank you for this time that we can spend together, and thank you uh, that we are able to, uh, to know you through your word. Uh, we pray and ask God that you would uh, be with us as we consider some of these things and just ask that um, that your spirit would guide us uh, and that uh, as we read your word whether it be uh, whether it be today or throughout the week God that uh, you would uh, help us to rely on you uh, to understand uh, the meaning of the text so that we can apply it to our lives uh, we just thank you and praise you again God for this time and ask that uh, that you would receive glory from it we love you, we praise you, and thank you, and it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, so like I was saying, we've covered um, some high-level stuff. We, we started kind of breaking down uh, the Old Testament, the 39 books of the Old Testament, Jesus Christ concealed, uh, then to the New Testament, the 27 books of the New Testament, Jesus Christ revealed. Uh, and from there, we got into some genres. Um, specific styles of literature and whatnot that we uh, might come across. It's not been an exhaustive study of all of the genres that we could encounter, uh, but the the main ones. So we've talked. Uh, let's see, narrative. We've talked law. We've talked wisdom. We've talked poetry, um, and so then this morning. We come to prophecy, and um, I was really looking forward to this one last week, and we're gonna we're gonna talk about that before we move into our next topic. Um, but just a reminder, uh, we have 
I want to say three weeks uh, left in this sort of setting, and then we're going to actually kind of end this class with a panel discussion, uh, and like we did over the summer. Uh, so I may at some point in the next week or so, or maybe even today, who knows, uh, come up and ask if you'd like to be on that panel. And if you read the Bible, you are qualified to be on the panel. So it's not going to be some, like, uh, you know, huge, huge deal, huge thing where, you know, you need to be nervous or anything. But uh, we're just talking about maybe how you personally read Scripture. Um, so if, if I ask you to say that, ask, ask you to, to do that, just just don't say no, you know. Just just yeah, great. Smile and everything. So we'll we'll get there eventually, um, and then uh, we'll have hopefully some of you on that. Um, and also, if if you have any any questions that you know maybe we haven't talked about, uh, there's a lot that we haven't talked about. So if there's anything that you you know in your uh, personal study of scripture, you're like. How do, I, how do I understand this verse, or what am I supposed to do with this? Something that maybe you've wondered um, for a while. I talked to Denny uh, the other day about cross-references. Uh, so we plan on talking about uh, how to use uh, resources to study scripture, anything from study Bibles to um, books in general, uh, but including cross-references. So if you have anything that, that maybe you'd like to discuss here, just let me know, and can't promise that I have all the answers, but we can maybe try and um, get to that in our remaining weeks, uh, so just email me, talk to me afterwards, whatever it may be. So, we're going to move into prophecy this morning, uh, talking about the Bible from the ground up, um, our eventual topic is going to be inspiration, inerrancy, and we're going to talk a little bit about translations uh, but just want to finish up our discussion on genres. So, prophecy. There are two types of prophecy. Anyone have any idea what those two types might be? I'm going with messianic. Messianic, okay. Maybe I should, maybe, like... Two things that prophecy does. How about that? Maybe that's a better way to ask the question. How about from the New Testament perspective where they talk about those who prophesy as foretelling rather than foretelling? There you go. That's, those are actually the two words. So, wow. we're, we're about, so <laughs> gold star of the day. Yeah, there we go. Um, a plus. You, yeah. So foretelling is the first kind of prophecy uh, that we'll kind of talk about here. But then also foretelling, oh, sorry, forthtelling. Did I say that wrong? Foretelling and forthtelling. Um, one is looking forward to events, foretelling. And forthtelling is, uh, would be more so of like calling back to uh, walking with God. So, if, if we say of prophets that they speak on behalf of God to the people, um, that's, that's kind of what we're going to understand forth telling as, where they're speaking to the people on behalf of God, calling them back to himself. Uh, but they also foretell the future. And so when they are foretelling the future... Uh, it's going to usually fall into one of two categories, and this is really, I think, where, where Rob is going. We've got salvation and judgment as the two types of prophecy uh, that fit within the foretelling. So foretelling how God is going to save, uh, what is coming in uh, even the Messiah, or what is coming uh, in the history of redemption. But then also there is foretelling judgment. So because they are not walking according to what God has required, if they don't repent at the foretelling, there will be judgment that comes about because of that. 
Uh, and so prophecy then uh, is one of the most difficult genres to read because within prophecy you'll find almost every other type of or, uh, of genre uh, included. And so you'll, you'll go from, from history to, uh, to foretelling to forthtelling to narrative, and it's just, it's hard sometimes to, to really get uh, a good understanding about a lot of allegories, uh, things that uh, might represent something else uh, that the author is, is specifically mentioning. Um, allegories and narratives in Isaiah, Proverbs, Ezekiel, Lamentations, Amos. Um, you've got prayers throughout Habakkuk um, and many other different examples that, that we could talk about. And then also you have to consider um, that each prophet is writing with their own style sort of thing. Uh, and so Isaiah is much different than Jeremiah. They're prophesying around the same time, but they're two different guys uh, with two different purposes, uh, and so their style is very uh, diverse. Uh, Jeremiah laments. Ezekiel is kind of like the shock and awe sort of prophet. Uh, Habakkuk asks a lot of questions, and Amos uses a lot of sarcasm and irony. Uh, And so... Trying to, to figure out you know, what's going on in prophecy is oftentimes difficult. Uh, but I want to talk just for a second and use a helpful illustration. Hopefully, Craig, is Craig here? You're going to help us out with this. So in understanding prophecy, I, I told you last week to be ready. You're so ready for what? Exactly. <laughs> If you could tell, you'd know. Yeah. <laughs> so, now, is that forth telling? <laughs> well, we're forth telling now that you're not ready. Um, but, I want to think about art for just a second. So, if you had to, um, had to give like a, a style name for art in the 15th and 16th century, what, what might you say? Realism. That, that's, that's the word I'm looking for. So, so in the 15th and 16th century, the art that existed was very detailed. And so you could, you could take a, a picture that was painted in the 15th century, um, such as this one. I don't remember who the artist is or anything. How can that be Napoleon in the 15th century? That's Napoleon. Is it? Yeah. yeah. Well, I have messed up. It would seem. <laughs> but it's real. It's it, all right. So, so maybe not 15th, 16th century. This is an example of realism. That's what we're talking about. All right, realism. I, I needed your help earlier in the week. I should have called. I, I'm not an artist. I think I already admitted that here, and have now proven it. Um, so this is this is realism. Okay, you could you could take this picture and zoom in on his boot and look at the buckle on his boot and find amazing detail. You could probably find even better detail uh, in this painting than in some of the pictures uh, that we take with cameras today. And so, so realism is, is looking and studying up close and it reveals much detail. But then we contrast that with uh, how would you characterize this as? What's that? Impressionistic. Impressionistic. We see that that this detail is not that great. I mean, you you know what you're looking at, but if you if you zoom into the picture, you're you're not going to find the detail that you would in the realism. It's just going to look like blobs of paint if you just like get a magnifying glass or something. Um, <clears throat> so. When we read prophecy, now is this 19th, 20th century? This is like, um, is that Monet? Around, this is like around the Civil War. Era. Civil War, okay. Well, there we go. So I got one right. 50%, there we go. Um, so when we read prophecy, if we read it with the mindset that, that we are going to get every detail and that the author is trying to explain everything specifically about the future, we're going to come away 
with a really bad understanding of what prophecy is. So, so we read prophecy more in the impressionistic sense, where um, the prophets did not intend to give us a telescope into the future. They provide us, as, as one commentator said, um, with a stained glass window colored by God's omnipotence, omniscience, and sovereignty over the future promises and peace for those who had faith in him. And so prophecy is not meant to give us every detail. It, yeah. No, that's really cool, that analogy. I like that. Because I remember, like, um, during the 70s, there were a ton of books that came out as far as the end times, and everybody had their description, of, you know, taking from prophecy and yeah. scripture what exactly right. like, this picture meant this type of war vehicle. Or, you know, yeah. Or, yeah. Yeah. There's, there's a lot of that exists, but, but that's not the point of prophecy. It's meant to, to give us, like, like they said, a, a look into who God is instead of giving us every detail of what the future is going to be like. And so <clears throat> reading prophecy in that mindset will help you understand it uh, because you won't be looking for, for, as Craig said, every detail of how the end times is going to play out. At the end of the day, we don't know how that's going to happen. But we know that, that God is in control over all of it, that, that Jesus is coming back, and he is going to, uh, to restore all things. Yeah? That reminds me of, um, I know someone that has picked one particular thing and said, well, the Lord's not going to come back until the temple is rebuilt. Right. So take that one scripture. Yeah. And so, well, I don't have to be right with the Lord until... <laughs> You know, the, the, yeah. that is Push rebuilt. Yeah. 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 So that, that's the danger of misinterpreting prophecy. Um, to, you know, put off, as they would say, getting right with God. Uh, when that's not what the prophecy is specifically talking about. So, read... Uh, read prophecy in more of an impressionistic sense, seeing who God is instead of looking for every detail um, of how things are going to play out. One of, one of the other things, prophecy as foretelling and forthtelling, another thing to keep in mind, um, and I can't believe we've gone this long without some sort of fancy Latin phrase uh, on how to study the Bible, but keep in mind what is called the census plenior. And so, if we look at that, it means the fuller sense. So when, when you're reading scripture, it's possible that the prophet who is writing or speaking is writing, they're obviously writing with a specific purpose and context in mind, but God may have some sort of fuller meaning behind the text uh, that... that he may be trying to get us to understand. Um, so we look at Psalm 22. Uh, we talked about this last week in, in the sermon, how um, that psalm was written, uh, I want to say, a thousand years before crucifixion was invented. And, and we've got the psalmist writing and saying, they will pierce my hands, pierce my feet, and, and all of these sort of things. The author writing that psalm didn't know that he was prophesying about the crucifixion. And yet God, because of his, his sovereignty and his control over all things, because of who he is, had a fuller sense to that prophecy in looking forward, knowing that Jesus was going to go to the cross uh, and have his hands and his feet pierced. Uh, and so we could, we could illustrate this um, by talking uh, about hiking or driving or whatever it may be, uh, I was talking to Todd. Where's Todd? He wasn't here. Todd. And, and last week, uh, was that two weeks ago on Saturday? You were talking about uh, one of the hills out at Zindel Park. How you get up, you, you're, you're hiking up the mountain, and you look up and you see, oh, there's the top. But then you get to the top and you're like, oh, there's the top. <laughs> and, and you get to that top and you look up and you're like, 
there's another top. And so it just keeps going. And so thinking of, of prophecy, thinking of scripture in, in this way, the fuller sense of the text, the prophet is, is looking up a mountain. And, and as he's writing, he sees what he thinks is the top. But God is seeing the whole mountain range. And, and so reading prophecy with the census plenty or the, the fuller tent, fuller meaning, fuller uh, understanding of the tent text, you'll see that, okay, the prophet had this in mind, but, but God had this in mind. And those two things don't, don't kind of like um, smash against each other. It's just God ha- is meaning something more in the text than the prophet knew about. And so, uh, think of maybe your hiking experiences, going up a mountain, driving up a mountain, whatever it may be, um, to see that, all right, you see what you think is the top, but then it keeps going. Uh, and so one, one pastor said this, <clears throat> a good example of a case in which the principle of the census plenior must be applied is Moses striking the rock in the wilderness so that the water flowed out to nourish the people. The passage relates a very real historical event and its most basic level of meaning refers simply to a physical rock that flowed with physical water. But this event was also a type of how Christ, the rock of our salvation, was struck with the rod of divine justice, and henceforth there flowed from his wounded body the forgiveness and spiritual life that we need. In other words, there's a census plenior, or deeper meaning to this event than just the real historical occurrence. 1 Corinthians 10.4, Paul gives us the express instructions to see this census plenior in this passage. And a little later he says that all things recorded in the Old Testament are written as types for our instruction. That's 1 Corinthians 10, 11. Thus giving us warrant to see a census plenier in all the scriptures. So so he's talking about Moses striking the rock. That is a real event that happened. But then Paul writing in the New Testament, looking back on that, says that that is picturing Christ who was struck uh, and flowed with, with forgiveness. Yeah. Right. The New Testament yeah. too. Like, like having the whole, like being able to know all of redemptive history, right. like, like the gospel and, and everything. Yeah. And then like, uh, like taking that fuller, fuller sense and going back and reading these things, then it's not just like a story about like somebody like, or like prophesying about like mm-hmm. this will happen. And then we can see it and then we're like, oh my goodness, look yeah. at that sounds like Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. And that a lot of people say, You have to have an understanding of the Old Testament in order to understand the New. And I would also argue the opposite. You have to have an understanding of the New Testament to really understand the Old. And if we want to read the Old Testament as Christians, you know, we got to go to the end of the book to see Christ uh, and to see uh, how he fulfills all of those prophecies and then seeing all the types and the shadows of Christ in the Old Testament. There is good foretelling also. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> um, well, that passage you read in Psalms about piercing before the time came. Yeah. When that was written, the writer probably himself wasn't thinking of crucifixion. Yeah. But it got put in there. Mm-hmm. And what's interesting is sometimes when you see Old Testament passages cited in the New Testament, they're not necessarily just from the pro- written by the prophets, but even from the Psalms. Right. Well, so that they would have had the fuller meaning yeah. than what you would have thought originally. Now Moses, he prophesied to the Israelites <coughs> if they would obey, yeah. good things will happen. If they wouldn't, right. bad would happen. Yeah, turn, for, turn from your ways. Uh, I opened to Hosea 6, <coughs> and I think I found an example of fourth telling. Um, it says, Come, let us return to the Lord. For he has torn us that he may heal us. 
He has struck us down, and he will bind us up. After two days he will revive us, and on the third day we will, he will raise us up, that we may live before him. So, return to the Lord that you may live. Um, live before him. Great example of foretelling. Um, just, that's where my Bible happened to open to. So, uh, then the, the, the last thing that we'll say about uh, interpretation, understanding... Uh, because we talk, we talk about a lot of different genres. Uh, but within each genre, no matter what we're reading, uh, we must always remember that the meaning of the text is derived from the author. So God used human authors to say what he wanted to be said. And now we have his word so that we can know him and live according to what he has revealed. Excuse me. And so that really um, is a great transition into uh, into what we will talk, be talking about with our new topic, which is inspiration, inerrancy, and how translations fit into that. Uh, yeah. Um, I have a question, like, with the prophecy, mm-hmm. um, like in, let's say, Corinthians, and then like in Thessalonians, it talks about, like, not despising prophetic under- utterances and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, obviously there was a problem in Corinthians right in the church. <laughs> yeah and um, so I mean I know in some churches we want to avoid that whole part of you know the gifts of tongues and prophecy and sure. all that stuff yeah so but um, but us not wanting to necessarily avoid that <laughs> right like what happened there what, what was going on with that type of prophecy, what was, you know, that's not a loaded question on it, you know, just um, Feels like it, Craig. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, um, there was a lot going on. Okay. Uh, I mean, within within Corinthians <laughs> specifically, Yeah. Um, I mean, they were kind of taking it, I think, to the extreme uh, and not practicing it decently and in order. Mm-hmm. Um, but maybe maybe we can grab a coffee. Uh, maybe we can get together. <laughs> uh, it's a great question. Uh, um, there's there's a lot, and I, I mean, some of it I, I just don't know. Yeah. I mean, um, Paul even brings up, you know, it's like, you know, desire this, but yeah. if you're going to desire a gift, you know, Desire right. to be able to prophesy, yeah. and then you know, I just was reading through uh, Thessalonians, and in there, mm-hmm. it, it, um, do not quench the spirit, do not despise prophetic utterances, but then also examine everything carefully. Hold fast to that which is good. Right. Um, but anyway, so yeah, <laughs> yeah, I, I think they were misusing the gift. Yeah. Um, so how about how about we? We get together and talk about that a little bit. We can do that if you want. Sure. All right. <laughs> yeah. Are people taking notes during the typo or carrying the S out of census? Census. I thought it was some. Um, um, okay. Yeah. 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 S E N S U S. Census. Census plenty or thank you. Um, no, that's fine. I, I think that's just a deeper question a than, than we have time. Yes. Yeah. yeah. But it seemed like it was like, I mean, he, they were talking about like almost more of like being encouragement and upbuilding the body, and people were getting right. all bent out of shape, yeah. going all kinds of yeah. stuff. Yeah. So in misusing their gift, they're using it for their own. Building up instead of instead of you know using a spiritual gift to build up the body, uh, short and sweet. Well, yeah. So the misuse of the gift led Paul to to speak on that. So we'll talk then um, about inspiration. So um, I just have one, two, three, four, five Bible verses to kind of introduce 
what we're talking about, and I'll just, I'll just go ahead and read them in the interest of time. Um, Psalm 12, 6 says, The words of the Lord are pure words, like silver refined in a furnace, on the ground purified seven times. Psalm 18, 30 says, The word of the Lord proves true. He is a shield for all those who take refuge in him. Psalm 119.89 says, Forever, O Lord, your word is firmly fixed in the heavens. Matthew's Gospel, Jesus himself says, Matthew 4.4, 4, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And finally, John 10.35, Jesus says that Scripture cannot be broken. And so from this, these five verses, we see that the Bible is no ordinary book. Uh, and so we kind of take some summaries from this. Firstly, um, the Bible is the word of the Lord. And so we, we say then that God is speaking to us through the Bible. Also, we take from that these words always prove true. The Bible contains no errors, specifically because of who the author is. But the Bible contains no errors. The words are eternal. It will be true forever. It has been true forever, and it will continue to be. Uh, we see also that a man's life is dependent on God's word. Every uh, man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that comes from the mouth of God. And finally, uh, that these words cannot be broken. All prophecies that we've even talked about so far, um, they will be filled. They will come to pass. Uh, and so when we speak of the Bible... Uh, that's, that's kind of a summary of what we're talking about in these five things. And, and so we ask the question, well, why is that the case? Why is it the word of the Lord that will prove true, uh, has been true forever, will be, uh, all of these things? Um, because li unlike anything else ever written, the Bible is both authored by human beings and by God. So we talked... Um, the first week about the author big A and the author little a uh, how God is ultimately the author of scripture uh, and it is a product of of his inspiration to use human authors to write his perfect holy words without error or defect so what God wanted to say to his people he used human authors to reveal by the power of the Holy Spirit the Holy Spirit enabled them to speak or write this revelation in their own words without error or omission as the very words of God. And so from the beginning in Genesis all the way through to Revelation, the books of the Bible present themselves as God's word and as true and authoritative. In this process, though, it's not like God... Uh, dictated to the authors of, of Scripture what he wanted them to write. They wrote with their own creativity. They wrote with their own style. They used their own vocabulary and yet accomplished exactly uh, what God wanted. Well, how can this be, you might ask? Second uh, Peter 1.21. Does anybody want to turn to Second Peter 1.21? Uh, Peter gives us this answer. Uh, in Second Peter one twenty one, when you get there, go ahead and just shout it out. For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men re but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. And so you, that was was that Nasby? Yes. Some other translations might say carried along instead of moved by, but it's the same word that, that Paul uses in Acts, uh, later in Acts, to say that, that their ship was carried along uh, by the storm. So, so kind of thinking then, well, the ship is carried along by a storm. It's still a ship, and it's still doing what it's meant to do. God also does that with the human authors of Scripture. He is carrying them along in the power of the Holy Spirit, but still using their own personal creativity, uh, word choices, vocabulary, whatever it may be, um, personality, to write 
what he wants us to have. And so when we're talking about this, what we're talking about is um, that God's word is inspired, or it is God-breathed. 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is breathed out by God. Uh, Paul actually had to invent that word uh, in the Greek, theopneustos, um, to, to talk about how scripture came to be, that, that God breathed it out. Um, and that's 2 Timothy 3.16, that all scripture is God-breathed. So these two realities, being carried along by the Holy Spirit <coughs> as human authors and uh, being that it is breathed out by God, what we learn is two things. God wants us to know him, and in his kindness he has revealed himself to us in the Bible so that we may know him. And secondly, God was kind to choose human authors so that we could understand God's word and have everything we need for life and godliness, as 2 Peter 1, 3 says. So, so God could have chosen to reveal himself any way he wanted to. But he chose to do it in a way that we could understand so that we could know him. And that, I think as we've talked, is, is an amazing picture of God's grace to us. Uh, that he has chosen to reveal himself in a way that we can understand. Um, so in this inspiration, another big, another big, um, big phrase to understand that God's word contains no errors is the process of inspiration is called verbal plenary inspiration. All that means is that the inspiration of the text <coughs> extends to the very words themselves, not just the concepts or ideas. And that's, that's an important distinction, that, that the inspiration of God <coughs> focuses on the specific words that are used, not just concepts and ideas. Uh, and that inspiration extends to all parts of Scripture and all subject matters of Scripture. So because it is God-breathed, or because God is the author, and he has inspired it in this way, it contains no errors. This is inerrancy. Maybe you've heard the word inerrant before. That is what we're talking about when we say inerrancy, that because God is the author, Scripture contains no errors. So, for a deeper uh, discussion and understanding on that, I would recommend a couple books to you. Firstly, uh, if you want to write down the Chicago Statement on Inerrancy. Uh, it was written in the, I think, late 70s, maybe early 80s, kind of defining what inerrancy is and, and what uh, to believe about inerrancy. The Chicago Statement on Inerrancy, you can Google that and find it for free. Also, Taking God at His Word by Kevin DeYoung. Uh, does a great job at explaining uh, why we can trust the Bible. Uh, and speaking of trusting the Bible, there was on the book table, it has not yet been returned uh, by all those who have borrowed it, a book called Why Trust the Bible by Greg Gilbert. Uh, any three of those resources will, will help you dive into that a little bit deeper, uh, have a, a more full conversation on uh, what inerrancy is, what God's Word is, and how we can understand and trust it. Uh, so I would recommend those resources to you to help you understand that a little bit more. And so then, when we think about inerrancy, maybe in the back of your mind, a question comes up, well, what about translations? Uh, my, my Greek professor, he likes to say, we have an embarrassing amount of translations of God's word. <laughs> and and it's, it's, it's God's grace and mercy that has allowed that to be, but there are so many different translations for us to choose from. So maybe you ask, well, what translation is best? Uh, he also tells the story. Um, he had just gotten to the hospital. His wife is giving birth, and the doctor is asking him, well, what English translation should I use? Which one is best? He's like, this isn't the time, but anyway. Um, so we'll ask that today. Which translation is best? And I'm sure there are a lot of different opinions, and there are many different answers that we can give because we have so many different uh, translations avail available. Translation, which one is best? Short and sweet, the best translation 
without any shadow of a doubt, is the one that you can read and understand. So, with that being said, there are some really bad translations. <laughs> There's even heretical translations. Uh, we talk about maybe the, the New World translations that the Jehovah's Witnesses have put together. Uh, changes John 1 to read, in the beginning was the word, and the word was a God. And so you don't want to be reading that translation. But if you're reading an orthodox translation that is faithful to the meaning of the words, regardless of the philosophy of translation, and you can read and understand it, read and understand that translation. So we'd say then that, that all translations have strengths and weaknesses. So what makes them different? How do we, how do we get from, from this? Anybody, can anybody read that? Maybe, maybe you recognize the word uh, logos right there. <laughs> maybe that'll help you out a little bit. John 1.1. 1, 1. John 1.1. 1, 1. How do we get from, from, I'm not going to read the Greek to you, but in the beginning was the word and the word was with God. So the New Testament written in Greek, we have it in English. How do we get to that? There's a spectrum of translations that exist. So this is, this is what we're dealing with when we look at our translations. On the left side, we've got what is known as a word-for-word -word translation of Scripture. scripture. Um, this is the big phrase, functional equivalent, equivalence. Um, it translates, sorry, no, formal equivalence, translates in a word-for-word -word manner and sticks to the original language even if the English doesn't make sense. So, an example of that would be the NASB. Great translation. It is the most literal translation that you can read. But sometimes it just doesn't make sense with some of the idioms. Yeah. I know what NASB stands for. I've never heard it called that. But okay. you, know, I, you may just want to say sure. yeah. what Great. it are. Sure. That is the New American Standard Bible. NASB. But there are so many abbreviations. Yeah. <laughs> there is. Yeah. I don't yeah. see ESV out there. Yeah, this was actually published before the ESV. The ESV is um, a revision of the RSV. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> that's because that's not a translation, and it's it's way off to the right of the paraphrase. Yeah, Phil. Uh, we've had a lot of discussion on accuracy of the Greek translation. Yeah. Right. Which one is accurate? Yeah. Which one is right? Yeah. See, all three are right, mm -hmm. but one is accurate. Right. Yeah. And so, so then on the other side of the spectrum, uh, in the in the translation, we've got the thought for thought, uh, and so that would be something like some of the newer new new international versions, the NIV, um, the NIV 84 kind of leans more. Uh, word for word. So not only within translations do you have different translations, but you have different years of different translations. So the, the New American Standard 95 is like the most literal, and then you've had some revisions from there and whatnot. But it gets a little ridiculous. Yeah. Now, related to that topic, I always found this interesting. Years ago, I listened to a guy named Lord B. Thien, who was a theology teacher, and he taught that God raised Alexander the Great to power because what happened was that Alexander the Great ruled over the country with a bunch of different languages. Mm -hmm. He wanted his army to understand exactly what he was talking about. So he invented the Greek language that the New Testament was written in yeah. so that it could be very precise and nobody would be able to misunderstand yeah. what God was saying in the New Testament. So. Yeah. Sure, possible. <laughs> God works how, however he wants. Um, so then translations, word for word, thought for thought. You see outside of the little bracket, there's the paraphrase. Um, that would be something like the message. So the message is not a translation. Someone took a translation of the scripture. Um, 
it might have been the King James, and then paraphrased it from the English so that his kids could understand it, and now it's published um, widely. Well, it's, it's not a terrible version. It, it, has, it has its place, and, and it is not a translation, but it helps, think of it more as a commentary to, to help you understand you know, what scripture says when there's a passage that you don't quite understand. Yeah. For me, when I was a young believer in my younger teens, the Living Bible paraphrase yeah. was extremely helpful. It just mm-hmm. was like, wow, I can understand this. Yeah. And so the Living Bible gave birth to the NLT, which is the New Living Translation, which is a translation and not a paraphrase. And so there's, there's all of these distinctions that exist in all of this. But at the end of the day, what we want to take from translations is that if it is a true and good translation, an orthodox translation, uh, not something like the New World Translation, it has its place within the church. And we can learn from whatever the translation might be, if it's a thought-for-thought translation that, that tries to make the English clear to make sense, or we can learn from the word-for-word translations. Uh, and so, whichever one you can read and understand, read it and understand it. That, that's, that's what it comes down to. Aaron, so where would you put the ESV there? Just to the left of um, New King James, probably. Okay. Aaron, yeah. I, I grew up in a Christian family, and of course, King James was it. Sure. So I grew up with that and was used to it. Yeah. He was not saved until in his 20s. Yeah. And the King James just, he used to, to, to complain that, what's the first thing missionaries do when they go into a country? They translate it into their English. Yeah. You know, I can't. Right. And then, right. And like two years <laughs> after he was saved, NIV came out, and he yeah. was happy. Yeah. <laughs> Did you mean just to the right of the NKJV? No. No, the ESV has better manuscripts than the New King James. Yeah. Because it was published in... It did, which, that's a whole other discussion on man... I, I was going to talk about manuscripts and, and how, we can, how we can trust the transmission of Scripture. Because a lot of people will say, you know, you have your Bible. It's a translation of a translation of a translation. But that's not how translation works. Translation is not a game of whisper down the lane. Translation is, okay, I have the original, and I'm going to translate it into something that I can understand. Uh, and so that's, that's what we have in translations. We've got the original manuscripts, and, and maybe even uh, you saw this week, um, they, they had the discovery in the, the cave where the Dead Sea Scrolls were found. Um, it was originally found in 1948. And so there's another cave that they think maybe housed some more manuscripts, but the manuscripts are gone, so they're not there. But we have continued to discover manuscripts of the New Testament. Uh, and so, so when we come to translations that are written today, we have better manuscripts today than we did in 1947, before the Dead Sea Scrolls were found. Uh, and so... As time progresses and as we find more and more manuscripts, it's just proving what we've already known about God's Word, that it is true and that it will stand the test of time. Uh, and so as more, more and more manuscripts come, we get better manuscripts and they're more full, whatever it may be. Uh, and so using even modern day translations that are based on those manuscripts would be better uh, because it's translating more clearly and back to the uh, original source better. So, translations. Any questions? I just have a question about the Catholic Bible. I can give you the KJV, however... They also have their own translation. Do they have their own? Yeah, the Dewey Reigns, I believe is what it's called. Okay. Yeah. I wondered, like, where does that fall on there? The Apocrypha? Well, that's just additional, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think it's either or to be the standard. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, thank you for your time. Uh, and we will be back together next week. Looking forward to it. Let me close our time in prayer. God, thank you that, that you have revealed yourself to us uh, in a language that we can understand. 
Help us to take full advantage of that, uh, God, that we might know and live according to your statutes. Uh, We love you, God. We praise you and thank you, and it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you, Mr. Potter.